Hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Graveyard Shift. And with me today Ooh. we have... <laughs> it's me, Emily. You can tell because I fucked up Max's intro, but this time it was by accident. <laughs> <laughs> sure, we'll, we'll, we'll keep to that story. That is the story! Fuck you, that's the story! I would never <laughs> ruin your intro on purpose. I've never done that, not even once. <laughs> Yeah, in this episode, we're going to be talking about found footage movies. And this is the subgenre of horror that is entirely based upon filmmaking, in, in my opinion, in that it's all about how can you sell your direction within this idea of, like, it has to be done in quote-unquote real time. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can edit a little th some things together, but for the most part, it's about being natural. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I think a lot of the best found footage movies are like that. There are some found footage movies that are like disjointed right like it's it's like tapes from across multiple time periods but i think the continuous ones are the ones that really stand out usually yeah those are the ones that are like really interesting like well-written ones like how can they engage me throughout this entire film now to be yeah. fair there's there are two films on this list and probably more but there's two on this list that i'm going to talk about that are more faux documentary so yeah but let's just kind of get right into it within my opinion the franchise that has been keeping found footage fresh and interesting which is the vhs franchise are you familiar okay. with these um i have seen bits and bobs of them mostly the first one mm -hmm. i'm familiar with the concept but you should explain it for the viewers at home <laughs> yes so what's special about the vhs franchise it was created by various indie horror movie directors who just came together and said, let's just make a movie that has like various different sh uh, shorts, all found footage, and we're going to try to connect them in some way. But it's loosely connected, so there's no like universe that's connecting all these shorts together. But let's just cr try to make a really interesting short concept, and we'll just fit it into this film. So it's kind of like your creep shows, your Tales from the Crypt, your... Um, Halloween 3. Halloween 3. Well, no, more like like a movie that's comprised of various different shorts, like uh, Tales from the Hood, Elvira, maybe. So throughout this entire franchise, it's just various new and former horror movie directors come in and make a really creative short. Um, some of the standouts, in my opinion, the last short of the first movie, really good. It was directed by the guys who did the recent Scream movies, uh, Ready or Not and Abigail, which we may be talking about next week. Oh, of course. Mm -hmm. There's two from the second film that I really like. One is a first-person zombie movie. So basically, someone gets bitten by a zombie, and you follow the zombie because it has a GoPro on its head. Oh, that's kind of cool. I, actually, I dig the vision there. It's really cool. I think it's made by one of or the duo who did the Blair Witch Project. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But it's it's very fast-paced, it's really creative, it's kind of darkly funny, or macabre a little bit, <laughs> in that, like, you, you get to see, like, what a zombie would do when it's first, you know, kind of, like, in action, like, this looks like I can eat it, it tries to eat it, doesn't work, and, like, when he starts infecting other people, and they start becoming zombies, it's really fascinating and fun. Yeah, highly recommend that one. The other one from that film that I really like is the um safe haven which is basically where a group of documentarians go into a indonesian cult and wacky wild shit just goes on from there i dare not spoil what happens there i would just say go watch that short it is insane <laughs> interesting yeah i it goes places man like holy hell you could skip the third film in the franchise, skip VHS Viral, it's not really that good. It was the film that kind of, like, put the franchise on hiatus for a long time. Like, the good six-year gap between the third and the fourth film. But I think the fourth film in this franchise, VHS 94, which is, the idea is that all these films are within the 90s. That's a cool concept, and I suppose. When was that movie made? uh 2021 gotcha okay so doing the 90s nostalgia thing i respect that it's really good um i think this one has like my favorite shorts out of all of them like each short in that film is so unique and so creative like just gotta say hail ratma uh i don't want it like that is a very fun short in that like a local newswoman goes down into a storm drain for 
a new story about homeless people. And I'm just going to say what it is because this might intrigue you. She encounters a half man, half rat creature that the homeless people worship. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of fucking awesome. Not going to lie. Dude, you got to look at what this thing looks like. It is in- It is so cool. All right. I will we'll get my live reaction right now to looking up Ratma. Oh, shit. Right? <laughs> fucking A. Okay. Yeah. It is awesome, man. Uh, the second short is, um, it's a mortuary assistant that uh, has to stay overnight during a storm and watch this person's wake. It's an, it's a closed casket wake. And let's just say various supernatural stuff happens. Sure. And it's really freaky because it's that feeling of like you're alone in this really cl- creepy place at night. Like all the lights are on still. But, like, it's just you, and it's eerily quiet. Like, it's way too quiet. I don't know. It, it gave me that really, like, if something moves, I'm going to freak kind of feeling. Sure. The veritable, uh, there, there was that movie about about a similar concept where it was, like, our possession of someone or other. It's, they're, they're, like, mortuaries as well. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, it, it's a really creative short. That's That's kind of the bottom line here. This might be my favorite short of the franchise that I'm about to talk about. It's basically a POV of a test subject of this mad doctor who's making cyborgs. Okay. And you basically follow the POV of this lady who has been kidnapped and experimented upon from this mad doctor. And a raid happens on his laboratories. And some of the other test subjects get loose. And it is just a... First person action body horror short. It is crazy. Like the moment you find out what you now look like is oh, no. terrifying because I'll just say what she looks like. She's basically got her bottom jaw, but her, her entire head is gone and replaced by a camera. Damn. Mm hmm. There's other really creepy, like I almost want to say Silent Hill meets Castle Wolfenstein kind of creatures in here. It is a really well done short. It's made by the same guy who did Safe Haven from VHS2. It's kinetic. It's frantic. It's awesome. And then the last one is a really interesting uh, short in which it follows a bunch of white supremacists. Okay. Do they die horribly? Oh, yeah. I'll say that right off the bat. But Excellent. It's basically them making a video promoting their cause and what they are using They manage to capture a vampire, and vampire blood in this world explodes. So they inject a little bit into a a rabbit, and it explodes. Um, But what happens is, the night before they're about to do their attack, they get really drunk. (laughs) They start fucking with the vampire, and it gets loose. And Oh, they get fucked up. Oh, yeah, and the vampire design in it is, like, very unique. Like... Hell yeah. It's not your, like, typical two-fane vampire. Like, it's some... It's taking, like, your blade vampire kind of idea and taking it to a whole new other direction. And that one's really fun. Because you're just kind of like, I don't care about any of these guys, and I'm glad they're all dead. Yeah, there you go. But yeah, VHS 94 is my favorite in the franchise. Um, There's other two after that in the, like, that's like VHS 99 and VHS 85, which are movies that all take place in those years. Like, 99 is this, like y2k kind of style horror to it that sounds really cool Mm -hmm. uh 85 has some cool has some cool concepts regarding like immortality that i thought were interesting but that is dope the reason why we're talking about vhs so much is because there is a new film that recently came out uh just a couple of days ago it is vhs beyond and the whole gimmick slash idea of this movie is all of the shorts are revolve around some kind of sci-fi alien concept interesting so like ufo horror stuff like that for the wraparound in this one they even brought in the the corridor digital people who have been known to prove that some of these videos are fake to come in and basically give their opinion on like ufo stuff it was really really fascinating they brought them in but the shorts are this time around are i would say Three out of the five in this are really good. The other two are just not really my kind of style of horror. The first one is just a straight-up action short. 
like it's a group of cops going in to raid a building in which these zombified people have been ki- kidnapping babies. Okay. And you find out that the whole the thing behind all of this is an alien stork. <laughs> And when you see it, you're like, that's fucked up. (laughs) So, like, the whole thing is, like, a play on, like, storks and, like, giving babies and stuff like that. Yeah. Them making it an alien is also really cool. It's got some great camera work, and it feels very much like a video game come to life. Because it's just them gunning down these zombie creatures. All I gotta say is, first person chainsaw cam, amazing. <laughs> that's that's pretty dope. I would the, watch just for that, dude. The practical effects are just insane in this one, and it's a great oh, yeah. starting short for the film. Uh, the second one is not really my favorite because I just feel like I've seen it many times before. I just think the setting's interesting. It's a Indian short in which a couple of paparazzos go to. Uh, take pictures and get it from some footage on this really popular Bollywood actress, and sure. they find out that she's a robot. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's that's a little played out. The, I think the only thing that's really interesting about it is that they actually do manage to have a Bollywood dance number in the middle. <laughs> okay, that is cool. So I, I can appreciate that, but otherwise, not really my thing. Uh, the third one, though, is probably the best in this in the whole movie. It's the idea of a group of friends get together and they go skydiving and when they go skydiving they start seeing ufos and they accidentally crash into one and you fall and you follow them falling (laughs) i see in real time and then once they hit the ground that's a whole nother scenario (laughs) oh shit like and the aliens are terrifying in this like the the cg is a bit but like it's just from the moment we start falling to the very end, it never lets go. It is just go, 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 go. It is Damn. intense. It's a great short. But I think my favorite one is the one that plays next. And I think you will like who directs this one. I'll save it towards the end. Okay. Um, it's this short in which a group of like animal rights activists go to get some dirt on this dog shelter owner. Like this dog, doggy daycare owner. Because she has, like, taxidermied some of her dead dogs. So they're like, you shouldn't do that. Like, we're going to get some dirt on you. We're going to question you and, you know, get, like, shock journalism. Only to find out that that's not the worst thing that she's doing. Oh, God. She she is kidnapping people. Oh. And experimenting on them and turning them into dogs. That's... Okay, that's... That's that's better than the direction I thought it was going. Well, you thought she was going to manipulate the dogs? I, I thought she was, like, reanimating the dogs, or she was, like, weirdly obsessed with the dogs and was like, these are my husbands, or, like, something weird like that. But no, she's just experimenting on people? That's, I can, I can, I can get up with that. Yeah, no, she's, like, she, she's, she loves her, and the, the short's called Fur Babies, and, like, when you actually see what these creatures look like, they're basically, like, like, they look, it, it, I don't know how to explain it, but it's basically, like, very hairy humans with like snouts and paws and like you see how she surgically manipulated these people to have paws like they have to like curl their knuckles up and put pads where their fingers used to be oh christ yeah like and but here's the thing like the performance of the of the actress is so she plays it like one of those doggy daycare like fur mama kind of things not you know like you have cat ladies this is a dog lady kind of thing that's fucked. That would actually be the part of this that fucks me up the most. She just plays everything with a smile. And I just was just watching this thing. I was like, oh my god, this thing is fucking insane. And the ending is hilarious because, like, it's a first, it's a found footage film, of course. Um, sure. So all these creatures have, like, dog cams on them. <laughs> and so you follow one of these creatures, go upstairs, and it's like this doggy playpen. It drinks water, plays with toys. And then the doorbell rings and it's a delivery guy. <laughs> and this thing goes out the dog, uh, the doggy door and just attacks the guy. <laughs> now, what makes this really funny is Justin Lawn and his brother made this one. <laughs> really? Yeah. I guess that explains why it's funny. Uh-huh. Oh, it's Lawn's so a funny. funny guy. It's really funny. 
like even when like you're following like the dog or the animal rights activists it's a lot of his kind of humor of that's just, fucking awesome yeah when you watch it you're also reminded like oh yeah this is totally the guy who was like i'll sew myself into a walrus costume <laughs> Because it feels like the best part of Tusk. That is a ringing endorsement. Well, like, for me, I love Tusk, but I just don't think, like, there's parts of that film where it's just really bad. I love the whole concept of that movie because it's just so bad shit insane. That feeling is in this short. Excellent. I mean, that's exactly what I would want. Yeah, it's amazing. It's probably my favorite short of this franchise, just of how creative and wacky and fucked up it is. Excellent. And it's like, it's never hurting the dogs. It's hurting the people. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's fine. Um, it's It works on John Wick rules. <laughs> <laughs> harming a dog is ontologically evil. Harming a person is Tuesday. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's exactly. the rules of movies. Uh-huh. And just to kind of say what the last short is about, um, it's this woman who wants to be a, a reporter and a documentarian. So she's put herself in the middle of like the i think it's like the arizona desert or nevada or arizona around that area and basically interviewing people about these lights that happen i think they're kind of trying to connect it to like the phoenix lights but eventually she actually stumbles upon a ufo okay and she goes inside it and from there on she just basically she's a documentarian she's a scientist so she has to explore all these little things and she touches this one thing and it cuts her and the ufo has a system that if you get hurt it will repair you so aliens come in she hides herself and the ship goes up okay and like at first it kind of messes with her and so she can't breathe and then so the machine comes down and fixes it for her then they go to light speed and she just gets obliterated and the machine still fixes her Oh, Christ, I see where this is going. Yeah, and the thing is, just to make it even more weird and fucked up body horror, is that she, when she was exploring, she found a spider and an octopus in these containers. I shouldn't say just a container, but like an alien-looking container, implying that they're experimenting on these creatures. And when you see her after she is put back together, the ship only recognizes the DNA from those creatures. So she just kind of, she has six eyes, she's got tentacles, and it's just, it's weird. It's not my favorite short because it's very slow paced and the ultimate like reveal at the end isn't all that impressive to me. But I like the concept. It's very, I like the concept too of like a stow, it is called stowaway. Like, I think that's really cool. Just someone just too curious for their own good getting stuck on an alien spaceship. And it's like, it's not the alien's fault. (laughs) (laughs) They were like, we didn't do this. (laughs) But yeah, it's made by Kate Siegel and written by Mike Flanagan. Oh, I know my plan again from something. Where mm-hmm. do I know I'm from? Uh, Haunting of Hill House, uh, Doctor Sleep, Oculus. I'm blanking on it right now. Midnight uh, Mass, I guess. And Bly Manor. That's what I know him from. Bly Manor. Haunting yeah, yeah. of Bly Manor and Midnight Mass. Mm-hmm. Midnight Mass, yeah, yeah. And his wife directed this. Hell yeah, that's awesome. This new VHS film is very good. I'm very curious to see whether they take the franchise going forward next. Just because I love this franchise and seeing just creative directors come up and do their own thing. I think we're going to move on from the VHS franchise. Is there any particular found footage movie you want to talk about? I mean, there are some of the like weird ones that take place on the internet that I think you guys have discussed in previous years. Like unfriended is an interesting movie. Yeah. Yeah. But that's a kind of style of found footage that I personally want to see more. Uh, partially because I think the traditional like, finding a camcorder full of footage that tells a story based on like fragments. I think that that has already, they've made the perfect movie out of that already. Uh, And I, I I personally just do not believe that it can be topped. So I want to see found footage uh, fall into, go into new territory essentially. Okay. Um, I'm curious what that film is. We can skip to it if you want. Yeah. It's Cloverfield. It's a hundred percent. All right. I'm going to be this guy. I'm not a huge fan of Cloverfield. Interesting. We're reversed from our usual roles. Yeah. Because I, I, I think Cloverfield is brilliant. Aside from being probably the best movie about 9-11 ever made. Jesus um, Christ. <laughs> I think it is the only movie that has been able to appropriately capture what it was going for with 9-11 in a way that doesn't feel like 
dramatizing or making light of the issue because okay. they frame it as a horror movie as opposed to being like a, a dramatic like this is what happened that fateful day or flight 187 or something like that yeah yeah like, or the, where it's this where it's this kind of like feeling of like oh by the end of it we're still america and we're still you know yeah like th- we're cool. still a country or stuff like that like this is i'll agree like this is more like the immediate panic of just this thing you have no idea what's going on and you're just trying to run for safety and, tr- and hopefully find your loved one yeah and that's the thing is it, it captures so well that feeling of being at like the ground level of something that is so colossal in scale that it can't even necessarily be comprehended by people who are in that situation it can only really be comprehended by a fucking drone cam shot above the city like we see in every godzilla movie right yeah but this movie never goes there it only for the most part outside of the ending it only really shows us what it looks like from the very like ground level of the street yeah and i think that was such a creative way to do a movie with a big monster i think it works really well and i really enjoy how chaotic and frenetic and disorganized everything feels as a result i think it's so cool and unique and it makes me so sad every time jj abrams makes a bad movie now because i've seen <laughs> this well he didn't make this he didn't make this he produced it though he produced it but matt reeves made this okay that makes more sense yeah i'm still mad at jj abrams uh rise of skywalker go piss in a fucking creek dude i'll let you i'll let you have this one (laughs) thank you i'm just gonna be mad at jj abrams for unrelated reasons but it makes sense that the incredibly talented matt reeves made this movie because it's very very good Mm -hmm. i think i am not a person who gets scared at horror movies easily it simply does not happen all right the tunnel sequence in Cloverfield. Okay, yeah, that is that is a good sequence to this day freaks the absolute fuck out of me i can't even think about it without getting like chills it's so unbelievably gross and creepy and well done and uh-huh. yeah, uh, I, love, yeah. love, I love cloverfield so much the sequels i haven't even bothered to watch but i love the original cloverfield so so much and i know that you're about to shit on it or not maybe shit on it, but criticize it, which is fair. And I think I criticism mean, of things that I like is here, allowed. Here's what I have to say, and it's just a personal thing. Like it's not—I mean, it's not like a personal, personal thing. It's just that I, when I watched it, it just didn't blow me away. Like I really couldn't get into the characters that much. Mostly, That's fair. Like I—I I mean, and upon hindsight, T.J. Miller, that too. <laughs> Well, yeah, but plenty of things with T.J. Miller in them are still good. Like the first I know, two I know, I know, I know. So we're, 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 we're going based off X marathon rules. One fuck you per review. Oh, yeah, dude, fuck you, T.J. Miller. Eat absolute shit and dick. That guy's an asshole. But, yeah. you know, he's, he was, unfortunately, he had a really good agent for a while there. So he's in a lot of stuff that's good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just, I mean, that wasn't the reason why I originally didn't like it. It's just, I think... For me, there's just some parts where I'm like, we're covering vast distances in real time here. Yeah. Like, we're going like 20 blocks in the middle of like this war zone to places here, here, and there. And we have to then climb up an entire building that's on its side. I don't know. It was just things like that that just didn't, that were just kind of bothering me of like, how and why? (laughs) Like, That's I, completely fair. That explains a lot because I have never in my life given a shit about that kind of thing in movies. When I'm watching a movie, my suspension of disbelief is fully there. Like I am, I am not a person necessarily who's going to go in and pick at the logic of how things are happening in movies if the movie is going to be cool as fuck about it. And that sequence where they climb up the building on its side, cool as fuck. I was huh. super into it. So that did not necessarily take me out. I of think it. for me. That, it's the thing about, like, I didn't really give a shit about the characters. Because, the like, he's going up that building to get his ex-girlfriend. Keyword, ex-girlfriend. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm just like, my dude, <laughs> run. Yeah. Like, she's proven to you it's over. I get you're trying to be a white knight here. And you know what, in this scenario, sure. But, like, I'm just thinking to myself, like, dude, you gotta run. <laughs> And yeah, I don't know. Like, think- I'm never usually that kind of person to like be like, "Why didn't you do this? Why did you do this?" Because I'm again, I'm usually more, "Hey, let the story tell it, tell the story." But when it's like a found footage, and you're in this real moment with people that are supposed to be naturalistic and real, them doing like stuff that's in a traditional Hollywood movie seems a bit more far fetched, in my opinion. 
That is completely fair. I think part of the reason I probably liked it then is because I, I did not, I was not colored by its identity as a found footage movie, personally. I, okay. Yeah. I came into this viewing it much more as this would be a story about people running around New York and the big monster would kill some of them and not kill others. And they were mostly there as objects to have violence done or not done onto. Mm -hmm. And that, that I was in for. Because obviously all these people are assholes. That's why I'm watching the movie. Like none of, none of those characters are likable except for maybe Lizzie Kaplan's character. But that's like, I'm not here to get necessarily engaged with these characters. I was there to see some crazy shit happen and crazy shit definitely happens. And it's filmed from a unique perspective that I, you don't typically see for this kind of movie. Okay. So I will, me, yeah, I will give the film that like for like the kaiju, like monster movie genre, this is so unique. And I love the perspective of that. And it's just, I love that about this film, but I can never find myself wanting to go back and be like, I'm invested in these characters. I'm more like, I kind of want to watch some scenes of the monster here. But it shouldn't be because that's not the point of the film. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I, I don't know. I just, I like it on the basis that it feels like such a unique experimental take on both what a found footage movie can do to emulate what like a big budget Hollywood movie would do, but like from a unique filming perspective. Mm -hmm. And from what a kaiju movie can do with being on a smaller scale. Because the thing that always takes me out of kaiju movies is I am a person where if there is too much prolonged fighting in a movie, I get really bored. I cannot watch a million attempts to kill Godzilla back to back to back to back to back. And the best Godzilla movies are the ones that make us give a shit about the humans. But usually what sucks about Godzilla movies is that I get bored of the action if it goes on for too long, and the human stuff is unbearably boring. Yeah, so that's fair. What works, what works about this movie for me is it feels like the actual quote-unquote action, I guess when they're getting stomped at by the monster it feels sporadic enough that it feels like a real heightening of tension when it happens yeah as opposed to just being the default or the or sensationalized it mm -hmm. really captures the scale of what it would feel like to encounter something of this size oh uh, yeah oh yeah of course like and that is just so kick-ass to me even when you're like above the clouds looking down upon the thing at one point you're just like holy shit like like yeah. even then it's just like gives it's gr such great scale to it those are parts of the film that i do think are really good i just can't see myself going back and wanting to watch this film again yeah that's completely fair uh cloverfield's good um it it and i have a lot of respect for american patriots uh and <laughs> legitimately while i've while i've made the odd off-color joke I do legitimately think that doing a horror movie like this is the only way to make a movie about 9-11 in a way that is in any way related to what that event was actually like for the people who experienced it. Mm -hmm. I I do think that it's kind of odd and disingenuous to do like drama, sad, heartstrings movies about it. Mm -hmm. Because to me, that feels very emotionally manipulative of like, we're going to get you invested in this character who's then going to die in a national tragedy because it was tragic. And I'm like... Okay, sure, but there's there's more to it than that. It wasn't just abstract tragedy because when you when you remove the horror of what that kind of violence and you know whether it's aggressed against America or not, right? Mm -hmm. I am I am generally not for doing like sad tearjerker stories in that kind of context because I feel like it's important to represent what that violence actually looks like because it's not sitting there and what and getting really sad about what happened it's it's chaotic and loud and horrifying it's it's death on a mass scale that we can't even visualize as normal people mm -hmm. right and so i think making art about things like that in this frame is incredibly impactful and important and i do feel the need to say this because i've been a little flippant about 9 11 during the segment of the video mm -hmm. but i do want to seriously talk about the fact that I think as a piece of post 9-11 art, Cloverfield holds up really, really well for what it's trying to do. Yeah, and um, I'm glad I you said uh, that about it. I'm glad you said that. Do you want, are you ready to move on and talk about a different thing? Yeah, for sure. All right, I'm going to skip to the two that I really want to talk about. Hell yeah, do it. Um, the first one is this little film called Savage Land. Okay, I've never I've never heard of this. So so give me the pitch. Okay, so the, this is a faux documentary movie about 
a small Texas town on the border between Texas and Mexico um, that in one night it just becomes a ghost town or less than a thousand people overnight just gets wiped out and only one person is alive to tell the tale and he gets arrested and put on trial and eventually gets the death penalty but the film follows what happened that night and if he did it and the only thing that we have of anything that went down that night is the man who survived the the whole night his camera in his photos that he took throughout the night we've talked about this in a video before we not in a video but we did talk about this off mic once okay sorry my memory's getting mixed up no no not a problem at all but like this film in my opinion is what i love about the found footage genre even though like there's no real footage of the event it's just photography so it really plays on the idea of like a, every picture is a thousand words what also is really important about this film, especially like what political environment we are in now, is the guy was a illegal immigrant. Okay. So they immediately pl- put all of the blame on him because of his race, because of his lack of citizenship. The fact that he was kind of weird beforehand, like he was a very quiet, reserved guy who would just take pictures of things. Like he helped around town, but he was never that guy. So... When, like, this, he was the last person alive, they were like, he did it, we're gonna arrest him. And no one dares to question what happened. They're like, we got someone, we're gonna count it, done. Because this was a town of mostly illegal immigrants and maybe some citizens. Okay. And it really plays on that, like, racial political tension that's in that area. And that's why I say it's a film that's more important today regarding a lot of political environment especially around the border. And this film has a lot of things to say regarding that. I think they handle it in a way that's really interesting and really not like, it doesn't feel like stolen valor. It's like, we're just going to show what it feels like to be in this situation. But where the horror comes in is with these photos. You don't know what this was. The film heavily implies what kind of, I want to say creature it was. Or, like, creatures. Okay. But they never, like, outright say it, and they never outright show it. They just give hints of, like, one moment they're down, and one moment they're up. But Interesting. Yeah, and it's just this really well-done tension, and you only ever see these things in blurry silhouettes. That's kind of... I I dig that as a concept. And sometimes some of the more terrifying things about it is that you look at these photos, and they'll zoom in on a part you weren't looking before, and you just see two glowing eyes like staring at you in the dark. And just oh, seeing okay. how vast and how just fast and violent this night was. And this guy was just trying to take pictures of everything going on. And it's such a well done horror movie. I watched this movie at night in the dark. And I couldn't sleep. I had to like kind of like, okay, put on some like sleeping music or something like that. Just kind of like, I need to calm down. <laughs> Jesus. It, it's that creepy because it plays on the idea of like there's something in the dark there. <laughs> and the way the film ends, it definitely plays on this idea of like, we don't know what happened to this. What happened here and there, it, whatever it was, it's just out there. <laughs> and like, if it's just going to still be out there, then like, what are we to do against it? Interesting. Like, it's very well done. And like, like two of my favorite characters in this film are the reporter that actually goes and like combats all of these like racist claims and things against people. And he's just the guy that's been like, Hey, I'm trying to find out what actually happened here. And when these photos are released, they're like, bullshit, not real. And he's just like, how are they not real? I literally just took them out of the the camera. Like this is like, this is a roll of film. And yeah, they're like, we can't use them as evidence because what are these supposed to be? Like, this is, this is absurd, but it's like, but it's what happened. (laughs) Interesting. You never, you never think about that with monster movies, huh? Of like, mm-hmm. people, people have to look and solve these crimes and be like, huh? Yeah, exactly. Fucking, was this a coyote or was it a werewolf? Yeah, I just imagine like you go like the crime scene reporters after like a Friday the Thirteenth film, like, how the fuck did a canoe paddle get there? <laughs> <laughs> like, but no, yeah, God. it's it does play on that a little bit of just like we can't solve any of this. And one of my one of the other character I really like in the film is like this former retiree border patrol agent who is very like neutral about the whole thing. He was he seemed like one of those guys who 
who did the job but never really has like any bias against Mexicans or anybody. He's just like, it was a job and this is how I see things. And I have to, you know, watch out for drug dealers and such like that. So he like investigates the site afterward and he's just like, I don't know how there could be blood trails everywhere, but no bodies. That just doesn't happen. If this were like a game related attack, they would want to show off that they did this. But like this little small town has nothing going through it <laughs> to be of any use for like a drug deal. <laughs> right. So he's just like this nothing's adding up here. It's just a very fascinating movie. Like like it's a Halloween film I want to watch from now on because of just how like creepy and well done it is. Yeah, I mean you've definitely convinced me to check it out because it sounds really interesting. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's a faux documentary, so like none of the shit happened. <laughs> they make right, it they they make it sound very real and like especially with like they show a racist podcaster in the movie. Oh shit, they got Alex Jones? He is very Alex Jones coded. That's awesome. So like it, it, you're like, yeah, I could buy that. <laughs> Yeah, and this film and this film like came out in like 2015 too, so it's very ahead of its time. Awesome. Yeah. Um. But the other film I want to talk about is a, is another faux documentary. This one's a little bit well known in that it's like it's that film that like if you talk to certain horror fans, you're like, hey, you heard of Lake Mungo? Oh yeah, yeah. No, not that one. But like, Lake Mungo is a great film. Like, yeah. For have you seen this? I know about it because I am friends with many of those horror fans. Exactly. Like, what I love about it is that for everything that I said, like, about the scariness of Savage Land, Lake Mungo has that, but it has such a good beating heart to it that's so relatable. It just makes the film more than just wanting to scare you. It's wanting to tell the story about grief. Interesting. Maybe I don't know what this movie is. I so, didn't think it was about that. So Lake Mungo is a movie about a family who lost their daughter to a drowning incident. And over the following weeks after her funeral, they start noticing things around the house in photographs, in videos. And they think that she's still there somewhat, like as a ghost. So they're documenting it. Um, the brother is, you know, getting footage of everything going on and they get a, a, a medium to come in and various things start to happen. And what I love about this film is that at every turn, it proves that there's no supernatural stuff happening, but then something happens where you're like, but wait, how did that happen then? <laughs> so it's trying to like be that rational mind of like, no, this isn't real. Like, this is not real. She's dead. There's no way that there's anything in the footage. But what's really funny is at the very end, it pulls the rug out under you. Like, oh, you've been looking over there? Look over there. And you're just like, holy fuck, she's there. (laughs) Oh, shit. And it plays on that pattern-seeking part of all of us of like, I think I see a face in the background there. Oh, God. And like the mystery regarding this poor girl is very fascinating. And there is a scene in this that is horrifying. Not in yeah. like a gruesome way of like Terrifier or an extreme extreme cinema film. That it's a concept and an execution that is just terrifying to me. Do you want me to say it? Sure. Okay. So they eventually follow this paper trail of all these things leading to this container of stuff that was buried at Lake Mungo. And they're like, okay, well, let's look through this. And in there is a phone, something with a video on it. And they're like, okay, let's look at this video. And we find out that this girl went to this place when she was with a bunch of friends and she just kind of walked off on her own into the darkness. And you see what she saw. And in the darkness, at first you see a little speck. And as she gets close, she sees herself bloated. Okay. And it's terrifying because... You're just looking at something that's, like, not supposed to be there. How they do it is very slow-paced. And because it's this, like, 2005-level, like, shitty phone recording, you're just like, what the fuck is that? And then you're also like, how is she seeing herself? And having video evidence. I think I'm doing... Yeah. No, I I, I get it. That's... 
fascinating and and so what is that like what's the what's the implication there so from what like i can say about the film is that and it's very left up to your interpretation because they never really like go beyond like hey what did that mean like what did she see the most that we can say is that like leading up to the event that she died she it was this thought of like i am going to die very soon so she was trying to either you know get to the point or trying to live up and try to give as much information as she could in those final days and then they also say that when she was alive she would have dreams about her screaming for her mother as everybody leaves the house and at the end of the film the family moves on and they've accepted that she's gone we have to move on and like accept what happened and they leave the house, implying that she was seeing premonitions of her ghost form way beyond before she died. And there was nothing that she could do. So she just knew oh. that eventually her family was just going to up and leave. Man, that's fucked. It is fucked. And at the end of the film, what's really scary is like earlier in the film, they made a point to say that the brother this entire time was faking the footage. Okay. So, so halfway through, you're just like... All right, so the whole thing's bullshit. And they're like, yeah, but we're still going to go down this because we want to at least know what happened. And what, because we find out that she was having sexual relationships with her neighbor and his wife. Oh, fuck. <laughs> yeah. So there's that going on. They eventually dig up the grave again just to be like, okay, is she still there? <laughs> And like the thing is, is like the dad has already kind of moved on because he was he had to ID the body, but the mom didn't want to see what she looked like, so she still has this thought of like she's still out there. So oh, it's God. just this family trying to like cope with what happened. And at the end of the film, that whole scene with the camera happens, and at the very end of the film, they pull back at all the footage, the faked footage originally, and they're like, "But look over here now," and they start seeing her. In that footage. Oh. Seeing that wow. she was all that. She was there. We just weren't looking in the right direction. I see. So the footage wasn't faked. No. Well, eventually it, w it was doctored initially. But when they go back and look at the old footage, they look a little harder and they're like, um, <laughs> what's that? <laughs> Fucking hell. Uh-huh. See, I, I, I get fucked up by, like, scary faces and shit in the background of things, so I do feel like that would work for me. And I think that's what makes that scene with the bloated body so terrifying. Because it is, like, that kind of internet horror, like, what the fuck is that in the background? Right. Um, It's a great film. It's emotional. It has great scares to it. It's, like, one of those films that, like, I have to recommend to everybody. Yeah, fuck yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. it sounds like you really dig it which is awesome and then you made me want to check it out like now i'm kind of like i should probably watch this because it sounds really good mm -hmm. just be careful because if you see it in the dark you're gonna be fucked up for the rest of the night that's fair again i don't normally get scared by horror movies so i don't know that something about this and the emotions behind that because again the film is very emotional and you're caught up with these characters so when you see something so fucked up like that for this poor girl who's just having to face the fact that like I'm going to die. You're right. just like, oof. Yeah. Yeah. Very. No, that's, that's dark very for sure. It's dark. It's it's sad. It's very yeah. sad. <laughs> um, yeah. I don't know how many more films you want to talk about. Like, I really uh, don't have much to say about the Paranormal Activity movies. I think they're fine. Just never really got into them. Yeah, that was never one that really appealed to me either, which is weird because I normally like ghost stuff more than I like other kinds of paranormal movies. That's that's just me, because I think ghosts are so thematically interesting to me. Like, there's a lot you can do with ghosts as a narrative tool. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, and I really... So I tend to seek out ghost movies, because I think there are a lot of really interesting concepts that uh, you can you can do with that. Like, uh, Pulse is a Japanese movie. It's not a found footage movie. It's a very, very good ghost movie. And that just kind of set me on a love of ghost movies that's persisted my whole life. But I don't think paranormal activity does the very much that's interesting with them. Not really. It doesn't, it, it just kind of feels like there are ghosts. Maybe. Ooh. Yeah. Like, I, it, I saw some, and this is not my original thought, but I've heard someone say that like every paranormal activity movie has all the interesting stuff in the last five minutes that ex that takes the ongoing story, pushes the lore a little bit. <laughs> yep, basically. So yeah, I'm just like, I, I don't want to watch that because it's going to be an hour of just, 
people doing dishes and shit like that. Like, that's not scary. <laughs> yeah. No, like, I completely agree. And it's crazy because, like, how are you going to let yourself get outdone by fucking unfriended in terms of actual thematic usage of ghosts? Yeah. Like, say what mm-hmm. you will about un- unfriended. We that talked about it. Being, yeah, that character being a ghost works. And mm-hmm. it makes sense to why it is. As opposed to ghost because scary, which is lame and dumb and makes me mad. Mm-hmm. I want good ghost movies. Stop using ghosts if you don't want to engage with what you can do with ghosts. Mm-hmm. Just make them fucking demons or specters or some shit. Yeah. Um, if you want a generic malevolent presence, don't bother with ghosts, in my opinion. Fair. I mean, okay, There's. I guess we have two more things we could talk about. One, we could talk about real quick and just give it praise and for the whole genre. The Blair Witch Project, we gotta just mention it because it is the film that started yeah. this whole subgenre of horror and i think it's good i just it's never been my favorite <laughs> yeah it's one of those things that's more interesting to look at as like an artifact of the entire style of filmmaking more mm-hmm. so than it is its own independent piece of art mm-hmm. not to say that it's it's bad but i think the things that spawn from it are much more interesting than it is itself and i think part of that comes from the fact that there is an argument to be made the, the way that independent horror filmmaking looks now is at least partially because Blair Witch showed how much you can do with not a lot of money. Mm-hmm. And so I think that it's one of those things where it's like, it's such an influential cornerstone of a movie and it matters so much to the way that found footage movies are the way that independent horror movies are like, there's so much great stuff. I just, it's, it's fine. <laughs> it's, it's it's just one of those things to me where it's it's more interesting as a historical artifact than it is as a film. That's, I agree. That's my take I on. agree, and that's the thing. I just got to give it praise. It's kind of like Citizen Kane in that, like, you got to give it praise because it's the film that is it started the modern film. But like, I mean, that's all right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like it's it's good, but it's not. A lot of the things that it inspired wound up being more interesting than it is itself. Exactly. That's, yeah. Yeah. Pretty much it. Yeah. And like one of those things is the film that I want to talk about next, which is not real. It's a found footage, more like uh, tapes or like a uh, the last recording of a late night show, which is Late Night with the Devil. Did you see this one? I did not, but I heard a lot about it because it was controversial for its use of AI. Okay, if we're going to... Now that you ripped that band-aid off. Yes. Um, yes, so in the film, uh, every time they go to commercial break or come back from commercial break, they show these images. And they have confirmed that they were initially AI'd into being, but then they had a graphic designer come in and fix them up. Now... Okay. Do I think they should have just got a guy to draw them up? Because when you actually look at what they're talking about in the film, you could have gotten some guy to draw that. I'm going to be real right. with you. Like, they're not that special. Like, they they look like cut to commercial cards from a 1970s talk show. But they're also not on that lawn. And there's so many other things in this film that were created by people. I honestly think it was just a cost-cutting thing. Now, yeah. if this were a bigger budget Hollywood film, then I'd be more pissed off. Yeah. I don't really have an opinion either way. Like, I think it's lame to use AI, but it's like, it doesn't seem like they, like the, it wasn't like the fucking chat GPT sat down and they were like, Jarvis, give me a movie. And then chat GPT was like, okay, here's a movie. And then they made that. No, it's this, like a, yeah, yeah, a this couple is... lame images that got touched up by graphic designers. And it's like, whatever it's, it's stupid, but it's not like, we have to be super up in arms and, and yeah. like that's ridiculous the <laughs> only reason why i think that this is as big a problem is that it came out so close to the strike right so that was still a big thing going on at the time or like it was yeah. still in the public consciousness so it's just like maybe we shouldn't like do that but everything else is all handcrafted so i'm like, but yeah the film is basically a late night talk show that was always like second to johnny carson because it was just that era and they're trying to make one last big push for audiences like to make a big ratings boost and save their show by bringing on a girl who survived a a occult sacrifice okay and she's claimed to be possessed by something and they're basically going to bring it out and talk to it and Interesting. the things that work in this film is one, David Desmalchian is fucking incredible as the lead, as the host, Jack Delroy. 
like, I just got to gush about David Desperation. He is one of the best working character actors we have right now. What else was he in that I know him from? Was he uh, Polka Dot Man in Suicide Squad? He was, and I was just about to say, I love this man so much, I dressed up as Polka Dot Man. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love that character. I love him in Dune. I love him in Oppenheimer. I love him in Ant-Man. <laughs> He's the guy who is like, Baba Yaga! Oh, yeah. Okay, he's been in a lot of stuff. Yeah. He's in every... He's the who's who of actors. Like, he's just amazing. Like, I love this guy. And, he, again, and this is the film that really shows that, oh, he could lead a film. He plays that 1970s talk show host very well. Fuck yeah. I, I believe it. That he sounds like the perfect fit for <laughs> that kind of a role. Yeah, no, he was so good in the film as that particular character. And, like, he has to portray a lot of various different emotions because the character himself has to be the talk show host and, you know, be very, you know, talking to the audience, talking to the guest, you know, trying to keep everybody in good spirits. But, like, the more you learn about this character and, like, the fact that he had a wife who passed away due to lung cancer, um, his show is failing... And no one, and everybody's like telling him, like, Jack, I don't know if we should be doing this. Like, we're messing with stuff we don't know about. Right. And he's just like, it has to work. This is all that I've put too much into this to have it fail. Like, it, it's just really good on that part. Like, the scares are pretty good. The ending is also very trippy and weird and very much like, what was real? What's not real? Interesting. I always it's- love an ending like that. Yeah, and it turns out to be a much more, like, emotional story towards the end than you would think with just, like, a very simple concept. But it's, like, one of those simple concepts that are is just taken to its utmost potential. So, yeah, I really like this film. Um, I think the guests that they have on it, like, the other characters in the film, are really interesting. You get one guy who's, like, this skeptic. Who was like a former magician, so he's just a fucking asshole. Oh, and does he die? Oh yeah. Excellent. Spoiler. Yeah. He he gets his, he gets melted. Oh fuck. Yeah, like they have some crazy kills in this movie. Hell like, yeah. Like one I night they keep doing the show despite people dying. No, no no well, hold on. That's more at the end of the film when the shit's hit the fan. I see. This film is more like, like the one kill that happens early on is they get this guy who's like a like a, a psychic and a medium, and he goes around and is like, "Oh, does someone have this? There's like the, some uh, someone with the last name P, be a Peterman or something like that." And then he eventually talks to these guests or like people in the crowd who lost uh, a brother and a son. So he's just trying to like cond- say like, "Oh, he he feels very happy." that you guys still love him and he's moved on and you know yada 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 yada. sure but then you find out later that like oh they asked like they had a lady in the crowd ask people questions oh fuck yeah so you're just like that fucking asshole and he has this like really fake like uh latin american accent like a really like i'm not gonna do the accent but like like a really Clearly fake over the top like latin american accent and then when he actually experiences a psychic attack he just drops it <laughs> like okay, there's pretty funny there's little stuff like that and then like he experiences like bad headaches and he throws up and they're like cut to commercial cut to commercial and they take him away and then like the next time they cut to commercial like the producer comes up and says like look man i don't know what to tell you but like that guy's dead <laughs> <laughs> like he died on the way to the hospital and he's just like what like, we can't tell anybody about this. Like, it's going to ruin the show. We can't. And he's like, keep it to yourself. Keep it to yourself. <laughs> There's like little stuff like that. And then when they actually talk to the demon, one thing I really like is that the first time that, like, she says, fuck, they don't yeah. censor it. But the next time, like a couple seconds later, they do censor it, implying that the guy in the censor booth caught it. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, okay, she's going to say it now. <laughs> You know what? You're you're convincing me that I should watch this. You're 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 selling me on too many movies. I don't have time to watch all of these. I know that's the thing, but it's just like this is what I love about the found footage genre, and I'm kind of gonna wrap it up here in that like it's this genre that is made to inspire creativity at its purest form. Because for me, I have always seen art as this thing of like. You can draw whatever you're, you want on this piece of paper, but you have to remember you are bound by this piece of paper. Right. So that's how I see found footage. It's like you can do whatever you want, but you have to keep it in this 
style. You have to keep it in the style of naturalism. And, like, it has to be in real time. It has to be with realistic dialogue. It can't be within movie cliches. So that's what I really love about these films. It's just, like, seeing very creative people just go buck wild. And this is also a genre that has been known to be very, like, hey, we're going to make a cheap found footage horror film and put it in theaters and make a quick buck. Right. Yes, but... so yeah, like, it's cool to have people who legitimately look at this as a venture and doing something creatively, artistically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Rather than just trying to do whatever the laziest, most quick route to having a movie out that people will put... that will put butts in seats. Mm-hmm. If you want an example, The Gallows. Sounds like a lazy-as-fuck cash grab. Yeah, but, um... Yeah, I'm thinking we're going to wrap it up there. I had a lot of fun talking about this. These were these were some fun, fun movies to talk about. Yeah, I agree. Um, um, it, this is, Graveyard Shift is always fun because horror movies are just a fun subject matter to talk about. Mm-hmm. And it, it was just, it's just been a blast. And, you know, we didn't talk about The Pope's Exorcist, so. Hey, not found footage. But yeah, we have two more videos releasing this month. We have our monster movies, part two. Watch the videos that I'm in. Watch mm-hmm. the videos I'm not in. Subscribe mm-hmm. to Max's Patreon. Give him money. I don't know. What's on our Patreon right now? Not much. I am I still have to go in and upload a shit ton of stuff. Fair. Um, so there's not a lot on our Patreon right now, but if you subscribe to it, I'm sure it will motivate Max to upload all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. So be the reason that our Patreon gets filled out. <laughs> it could be you. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So like, subscribe, and share. And that's all I got to say. Bye.